Hi, everyone, and welcome to Pricing Matters. Today, we are pleased to have Stephanie Yee, a pricing expert and associate partner at Bain Consulting. Welcome, Stephanie, and thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me, Gabe. I really appreciate it. It's it's our pleasure, and uh, so glad to hear that things are getting a little bit back to normal after all the you know <laughs> challenges that you guys have had over in the in the Houston area over the last couple of weeks with the weather. Really crazy stuff. But yeah, definitely, it's uh, not something that I would want to relive anytime soon. So you know, the basics of yeah. you know heat and water can't be overstated. Yeah. Yes, so that, uh, definitely some interesting stories coming out also about utility pricing and, and what, ha what, what happens when the markets are completely unregulated. So let's get, we can maybe get into that in a minute here, but uh, before, we, before we kind of get into some of the deeper pricing topics, why don't we start off for folks that you know don't know you, just a, maybe we can talk a little bit about your experience and background. Yeah, 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 for sure. Um, so I started my career in consulting. I was at Deloitte for a number of years out of their New York office. Um, when I joined Deloitte, I actually joined them in their technology practice. And so for a number of years, I was working mostly in the sales and marketing tech stack space, um, but doing work for a number of different industries. So think uh, small, medium sized software companies, government, did quite a bit of work with telco, you know, mostly um, helping them think about their CRM and ERP systems, but also to, you know, customer market analytics and all of those kinds of things. So really worked um, with the business teams who were thinking about, you know, how do they think about this space and enable it with technology and all of that good stuff. Um, so started my career there and then uh, moved into industry. I actually was uh, working for the client on the, on the consulting side um, mm -hmm. and then had an opportunity to present itself to join uh, the client team. The client I was with at, at the time was uh, Cisco Foods. It's a distribution, very large uh, food service distribution company headquartered out of Houston. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, they had asked me to come join and lead their, their pricing work. Um, at the time, I never had never done any pricing work uh, before, but um, they were, you know, kind of really excited to have me on the team and kind of said, look, our, our pricing is super complex. So you'd have to, whoever took on this role would have to learn it anyway. Um, and so I uh, ended up over there for a number of different years. At my time at Cisco, um, I played an operator type role. I um, really helped the company stand up their revenue management and pricing functions, um, worked very closely with sales, as you can imagine, because you know all pricing work at the end of the day ends up in the hands of sales to execute right. really. Um, and so in the last couple, years I was there, uh, led their sales transformation efforts as well as they were thinking about really um, their go-to-market model and how they might want to do things differently from a customer centricity standpoint. Mm -hmm. uh, was doing work over there and then uh, happened to uh, come across Bain at a pricing conference um, and had a chance to speak over there, meet, met with the global leader of pricing um, at Bain. And so, you know, we kind of started discussions around, you know, what a path a career might look like at Bain and, and then decided to join Bain about a year and a half ago now. Great. So what's that like going, you know, from consulting to industry and back to consulting? Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, it's interesting because I think there's definitely different parts of each that I've really enjoyed from a career perspective. I think, uh, you know, starting a career in consulting, I'm actually a really big fan of that because I think it's a good way to very quickly see a whole lot of different sets of industries, um, lots of different sets of problems. And I think one of the things that I really loved about consulting was you learn a good good base level skill set around framing up problems, how to solve for them, and all those kinds of things. And I think actually serves you quite well, you know, no matter where you go. Um, I think for me, you know, my initial decision to leave consulting had a lot to do with more of the personal life aspects. At the time, I was traveling and on the road quite a bit. Um, and, you know, wanted to start a family and, you know, be home more and all those kinds of things. Um, and also, too, wanted to build some deeper industry expertise and subject matter expertise, because I think, you know, in the early in the early years of consulting, oftentimes you're in this kind of generalist type model where you're learning a lot of different things, which makes right. you pretty well rounded, but you're not very deep in a particular topic. Mm -hmm. um, and so went in the industry to do and get some of those kinds of experiences. And I'll tell you that um, there's some certain things that I experienced being an in industry that I really enjoyed. I mean, the two biggest things I would say is 
One is that, you know, you really get to see any program or work that you do end to end, you know, so yeah. from designing to solving to actually implementing and keeping the lights on and water running and all that good stuff. So there's definitely a yeah. sense of um, real tangible results from the work that you're doing, you know, because you can kind of see how that evolves over time. But I think my favorite part of being in the industry is um, you really get to build, at least I was fortunate enough to build, you know, a, a team and you get to really um, mentor individuals and see them progress their career over a long time frame. You know, so you can bring somebody in at, at a certain you know, level of capability and see over the years because you're there for a long term for them to really grow and be a part of that uh, career progression and development. That's that's very, very rewarding. Yeah. But I think I found myself at a space where, you know, I had been at Cisco for eight to nine years, had developed really deep expertise in that industry and in a certain topic area. Um, and I wanted to really see that apply across other industries and learn new and different things. And, you know, consulting is just, it's a great place when you want to learn on different topics, get exposure to more industries and things like that. So um, yeah. ended up decided to go back. Yeah, I, I mean, I feel the same way. I actually started off my my career in industry at a, a, the other Cisco, the other big Cisco, yeah, Cisco yeah. Systems. Yeah, what everybody and, thinks. Of. Yeah, well, no, actually, when I, I I grew up in the Midwest, so when I told people when I got out of Berkeley that I was going to work for Cisco, everyone actually thought of your Cisco. Oh, the really? Cisco Foods, yeah, the one that you see on the truck. They're like, "What are you driving a truck or something or what?" No, no, it's a little bit different than that. You know, we make <laughs> networking. Yeah. But I started off on the CPQ and, and pricing side there and then got into the pricing software and, and kind of, you know, consulting kind of around the implementation of software. And I, that's really what I like about about our industry is the same thing. You get to expose to all these different industries and you're focused on a specific problem around price, you know, price optimization, CPQ, that whole, you know, quote to cash space. Um, but you get to see, see it across a lot of different industries and companies and see how they do it, you know, and what are the, and I, I find you can really, um, by doing that, you can oftentimes use things that you learn in one industry and another one that people yeah. haven't thought of. And, and that's really cool when you can bring something, you know, from one industry to another and, and really kind of leverage that, that, uh, that more holistic view. Um, I so. completely agree because that's, that's actually quite fun, right? Because it's, that's the creativity of, learning and seeing what one industry is doing and then being able to say, oh, well, this is kind of like this other industry in certain ways. They're not exactly the same, but here's how the same like principles right. actually apply. And I think that that's where sometimes innovation in, new industry, in an industry comes from is just seeing what others are doing and then trying yeah. to figure out like, how does that really Absolutely. You know, really yeah. Work? And, and, you know, being in the distribution space, I think we're seeing a fair amount of that play out, right, in B2B and in distribution with, you know, Amazon coming in and, and a lot of, you know, digital first and channel disruption happening. So let's focus in on distribution a little bit, since that's where a lot of your industry experience is. Um, when you look at kind of pricing or like quote to cash or just in general, you know, what do you think the top kind of challenges that distributors are facing today, you know, today and kind of going forward? Yeah, I think well, that's a pretty broad topic. I think there's a lot of different things. Um, I think that in the distribution, there's there's compression. I think all along the value chain, right? So you've got the suppliers on on the on the on the on the back end of it, and you know you're seeing more and more digital disruption, digital natives, and things like that. And so what I would say is like suppliers have more choice than ever in terms of who they go to to help distribute their products, and some of these digital tools are making it a lot easier for them to directly access the customer and work with different players than they might have historically. And so I think from that perspective, you know, distributors are facing some challenges um, from, a, a, from a, a compression standpoint. I think on the customer side, especially where, you know, um, you've got customers that are smaller and things like that as well. All of us are being influenced by the way in which we're able to shop on e-commerce, what we have come to know and expect is, is a good buying experience. And I think people are bringing in those kinds of experience and coming to expect, well, if I'm going to interact with you, you know, I want it to be seamless, easy, digital, you know, all of these kinds of things. Um, and also, too, again, you know, with more and more players like Amazon and other folks in this space, there's become much more. Um, I think higher expectations in terms of service levels, deliveries, and all those kinds of things. Uh, but I also think that you know, with 
more of these e-commerce type channels, there's a little bit more transparency in the marketplace in industries that have been typically been pretty opaque, especially when it's come to pricing. Mm -hmm. And so all of this to mean is that there's a lot of pressure on both ends of the spectrum because distribution, you know, those those companies typically sit in the middle of that value chain on both mm -hmm. ends to up their game um, and to really compete more effectively in a space that's become very tight. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I think especially with 2020, you see a, a huge growth in direct-to-consumer activity, right? And so it, it really magnified some of the challenges that distributors were already facing, especially then when you put in the, the supply chain disruption issues that are happening and then the demand disruption or demand increases that are happening on the other side of it. So it's it's pretty interesting time in, in tw you know uh, to be a distributor right now. But I think a lot of it, um, you know, the ones that are, are thriving are really able to grow profitably. And, and they're 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 able to uh, do that by really focusing on the customer's value and and kind of pricing their not only products but services and the whole service level around and the whole experience around that that customer expectation and meeting that more effectively than you know their their competition. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah and the competition. Agreed. And, and and I'd also say you know um, you know business agility is is a huge thing, right? So margin compression, you know, the, to combat margin compression, you really have to be agile in your pricing and in all your you know strategy and, and tactics as a distributor, but as a business in general. Um, can you talk about like how maybe some of your experience in helping distributors be more agile with regards to their go to market, their pricing, their you know their commercial strategy and tactics? Yeah, definitely. So I think, you know, what we're seeing as we work with our clients is there's historically been, you know, in this space, okay, I'm going to set my prices and I'll forget it for a while and all this kind of good stuff. And there's not a lot of discipline around sometimes even updating the pricing. There's all kinds of levels of maturity I've seen as, as we work with different clients. And the thinking is, how do you move towards a model where you know market competitive dynamics begin to influence your the way that you think about updating your pricing? You know, if you think about the other end of the extreme, in some of what we experience in our B two C kind of shopping experiences, is that you'll see that depending on the market, what's happening with other e-commerce sites and things like that, you'll see price adjust multiple times throughout the day, like say on an Amazon or whatever the case may be. Not saying that B2B companies need to be on that end of the spectrum, you know, but the, the thinking is that as market competitive drivers change locally, that you think that you update your pricing on a more regular basis, your cost inputs, all of those kinds of things, so that you have the most relevant pricing that you can and you're optimizing it the best you can. And so that's kind of the agility that I would think about from a pricing perspective. How do you think about the levers that matter most to your profitability um, and make sure that you are, you know, really have a mechanism in place that helps you update it that in a scaled way, in a regular way. Um, I think the same thing around um, how you think about your sales organization, you know, um, I think that using more, analytics and more understanding of like, where are your uh, most, uh, your customers that you care about the most, your most valued customers, where are those profit pools moving? Where's your opportunity in terms of like white space and your best customers, and then allocating your sales force to really cover those market spaces um, in, in the best and most efficient way is probably, I think some of the agility that you know, in the sales organization, you need to make sure that they're your most prized resources, like direct sellers, are pointed towards your best opportunities. And refreshing that on a regular basis so that you've got a current way of thinking about that. Um, and I would say that one of the things I see companies doing a much better job at and companies that are doing better at responding to the marketplace, there's a little bit of organizational agility, which means They've got an ability to really focus on the things that they know will really matter and move the needle, but they have a good way of bringing together cross-functional teams against these priority type big initiatives and having those teams work together in a very targeted and focused fashion on going after the big rock opportunities. Yeah, I think, yeah, that cross-functional collaboration is really key in pushing change at an organization, any organization really, but can you talk about how companies can, you know, foster more collaboration and, and more trust between those teams and more of a sense of, hey, we're all trying to accomplish the same goals here and, and you know, but not just like in theory, but actual in practice? 
Right, 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 right. This is a topic I'm super passionate about. I gave like a, a whole hour long speech on this one at the Professional Pricing Society a number of years ago. Um, I think it starts with really working together alongside the sales teams to develop the actual solutions. So what I see oftentimes is, hey, pricing has a team, they're working on the next pricing program or you know updates to pricing and, and they're doing that kind of on their own in their own kind of silo and function. And I think t- in my opinion, in my thoughts, that's, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Mm-hmm. I think that oftentimes um, where I've seen it work really well is at the start of it, sales is already involved in the conversation. We have a common goal here. We're trying to increase profitability revenue, you know, for the company. And so let's work together around what that solution needs to look like. And a lot of times that means, um, you know, sales and pricing working alongside each other to actually co-develop some of these solutions. And I've seen that when they are, when the, the teams are involved together with a common goal and they're both trying to solve towards the same problems in the field, you know, not at, you know, just at the corporate headquarters, but like actually, you know, working with the folks that are working with customers on a day-to-day basis. Um, there's a richness in the feedback and in the solutions that then really um, we know work in the field, you know? And so I would say definitely there's this co-creation aspect that's really important right from the start. And then I think it's working alongside their teams in order to develop that proof of concept to scale and then refining and iterating based on what we're finding works, doesn't work alongside with each other. And so you end up with this, over time, like this end product where you've got both these teams working together for a solution that works best for the company. Um, and they've already had, you know, their input and design, you know, and, and their feedback incorporated into that solution. And so when it mm-hmm. when it then hits the field for everybody else, it's like, okay, well, we know this works because we've been working, you know, with the, the field and sales teams to really make sure that this is a solution that works. Um, and you put some early wins on the board and you make sure to celebrate them um, so that people can can see kind of, you know, the results from the solution. Yeah. yeah, I agree. I mean, when I've seen, you know, change management work the best in implementing, you know, pricing software solutions, it's always been one getting, you know, the leadership buy-in in the commercial organization to kind of drive it, but also taking the mindset that it's not just pricing that we're trying to make better. We're also trying to make the commercial team's life better. And prioritizing some of their requirements in addition to, you know, what you're trying to do from a pricing perspective, right? And and then taking an iterative approach and say, hey, we're going to, you know, this isn't done when we roll it out. It's just the beginning of it. We're going to get your feedback and we're going to make adjustments. And, and uh, you know, some of our customers have been really successful in doing that. And I always uh, try to encourage our other customers when they're thinking about that journey to to take that kind of approach right and 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 to you know to get the feedback and not just say hey we're going to dictate what we're going to do because you know we know best right and and kind of operate in an ivory tower but really take that holistic approach and get get those commercial teams not only buy-in but feedback and make it feel like okay they're they're actually going to make my because you know pricing and quoting and getting approvals it can be a real pain for this the commercial team so if you can make that process you know more efficient and more effective then they're going to be you know glad that you did right and and especially if you can do it in a way that's you're providing more guidance to them in a way that's that they understand right, right. that they can really get behind then they're not scared of it right they're not well I'm, I'm not going to be able to make the sale at that well you are going to be able to make the sale at that because look at all your peers and look at how they how what we're asking compares to the pricing that's out in the market right now it's not unreasonable and so, you know, those kind of things can go a long way, I think, in, in the effectiveness of, of pricing. I, I completely agree. I think, you know, when we started uh, in working with sales, one of the big things that we try to focus in on was like, how can we, what, what pain can we remove by the work that we're doing? And I think you hit the nail right on the head. I mean, one of the things is that, you know, fundamentally, you want your sellers busy selling, you know, and right. so, and, and not, you know, figuring out how to price and number of deals and going through spreadsheets or whatever it is that they're using to try to figure that out. And mm-hmm. they think also too, honestly, um, especially, you know, with new sellers, it's daunting, you know, to try to figure out like, how do I actually price all this? And, and I think that, you know, especially for some of those newer sellers, they were always kind of a little bit relieved to know that, okay, I've got a system that I can trust 
you know, that can help me through this. And I don't have to, it takes a lot of the guest work out and it takes a lot of the ramp up time out in terms of getting somebody up to speed. Right. Um, I think you also raise a good point around leadership buy-in. You know, I think it's great to get leadership buy-in at the start, but the reality is a lot of times you don't maybe even necessarily have have that. You know, oftentimes um, we find that the senior sales leaders are also a little bit skeptical or wary of, you know, pricing changes as well. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's where, you know, what I shared in terms of like, early wins is super, you know, important. Let's start small in a place where, you know, we're not, you know, we're not going to drive this thing off a cliff and allow us to like, you know, kind of test and learn and some other things. But I think also too, you know, oftentimes um, sales leaders have lieutenants or people that they in the field feel like they're, you know, highly respect or highly regard the way that they think about things. And so oftentimes, you know, a conversation early on with some of those sales leaders to say, okay, well, who's, who, who do you think is the best informed in this space, you know, in your organization that you trust, you know, mm-hmm. well, let's make them a part of the team and the council of the group of the folks that we work with, you know? Yeah. Um, and I think that helps as well. Absolutely. Yeah. Getting those kind of ambassadors within the commercial organization that are respected and kind of can help talk them through and say, Hey, this isn't, this isn't a bad thing. I'm doing it here. Yeah, absolutely. That's a big part of it. Um, all right. Well, let's, I think we kind of covered the change management aspect. Um, one of the things I think that also, uh, you know, you, you help do and, and we help do is uh, for companies and distributors is um, in general, uh, reduce margin leakage, right? Like get more visibility into all of the, the things beyond just the price that I'm putting on the invoice. But like for a distributor or for you know manufacturers too, or, or retailers, there's a lot of things that influence the profitability of a transaction, right? Um, so it could be you know what what buy side rebates, what are the vendor allowances and vendor rebates that are going into this? You know what are my my costs to serve this this client? What are uh, the cost of goods and how do those vary? What are my variable manufacturing costs that that are coming out of this? And bringing all of those things together into kind of a waterfall view and being able to use that when you're negotiating is something that um, we help you know a lot of our clients do it, but actually very few companies in the world actually have that ability. Like one, one of our early clients that um, we were just talking about this the other day is uh, with um, with our CEO. You know, he told this story of one of our early clients that had a sit down with the president of the division where we had rolled out. And, and he said, you know, I really have to thank you, Marchin, because for the first time in our company's history, I can actually see the end to end profitability of mm-hmm. a customer. And we could never do that before. And I know coming from my my experience at, at Cisco Systems, we didn't, you know, there were all of these different factors and groups that had an influence on the profitability of a deal that we were negotiating with a client, but you couldn't see all of those things together. So can you talk about like how, in your experience, like how you've been able to help companies do that or what you've seen in terms of like systems and, and, and processes that help enable that type of uh, that view? Yeah, absolutely. And I couldn't agree with you more. I think that this is a space in terms of end to end, like margin waterfall profitability. Very few companies uh, I've been to have had that, but we've helped companies build that view. And it's always been a tremendous unlock for the companies because then it helps them think through, oh, well, first of all, answer the questions. You know, you're going to be surprised at how many folks don't really know which are the most profitable segments of customers and customers to serve, but it helps you make better decisions then around, well, you know, understanding full profitability, where do I have people that uh, are customers that are laggards where I want to move them to a different quadrant or at a different level of profitability, and how do I think about which levers to use to really do that? Um, It helps us understand, you know, for our most profitable customers, do I want to treat them a little bit different in terms of coverage, service levels, tiers? and all of those kinds of things. Mm-hmm. Uh, I think one of the most challenging parts is that oftentimes, you know, it takes a lot of systems, you know, mashing together information from a lot of disparate systems to bring together this full view of everything that's happening from pricing all the way down to, you know, the cost to serve for the customers. And there's often, too, quite a bit of debate around, you know, how to allocate costs to customers with, you mm-hmm. know, finance and all of that kind of stuff. And so for all of those different reasons, you see that a lot of companies don't put that together. But when they do, it's very, very powerful because you can imagine a world in which you're saying, I can see by lever now where I'm having revenue leakage and then be able to start to think about programs you design to close up that leakage. So 
in distribution, for example, one of them may be, you know, um, delivery expenses, one of the one of the biggest expenses, you know, in a distribution business model. And if I'm often doing expedited delivery and things like that, and that's increasing my cost to serve, but I'm not capturing any value, you know, of doing that with my customer, that's an opportunity for me. Um, and so I think that that can be very helpful. I think the other thing is that there are also too, you know, rebates and incentive programs and things like that that show up in that in that waterfall as well. And I think sometimes people um, tend to underestimate the level of investment we're making in a customer on some of those off invoice and rebates and incentive. Yeah. Programs that kind of sit to the side, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think that um, you know, there's often not very strong discipline around understanding if I provide a rebate to try to drive these certain customer purchase volume behaviors or private label brand behaviors or whatever it is the behavior is, there's not a lot of rigor around um, looking at whether or not those incentives actually deliver the results that yeah. you were hoping for. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there's opportunity. There's a ton of opportunities there as well. Yeah. Yeah. We have some, uh, you know, clients that are really trying to actually incorporate some of that, the net price. So, so inclusive of the, the off invoice incentives at the time that they're providing the price to the customer. So they kind of get credit for it because if you're doing an apples to apples comparison or trying to, and one cause, you know, one of your providers is giving you a rebate and the other's not, then you don't really understand you know what that is unless they can actually kind of do that real-time calculation but on the flip side of that you know having accounting for that when you're looking at a customer's profitability you're setting a price it's a, it's absolutely a must and then as you mentioned there's a ton of opportunity at most companies on tracking the effectiveness and the whole accruals and credit memo generation process um you know a lot of time that's just kind of a, a group in sales finance that's off doing that and it's, they don't even think about it as being part of, you know, the price setting process, but it is, I mean, it's affecting the net price that the customers are paying. So you should both be able to, you know, show that when you're quoting to a customer account for it in the profitability, you know, and the revenue for that customer, and then automate the process around administering and managing those. Um, and that's, you know, to do that really, you know, you, you need, you need systems to be able to do that. Right. So that, that's a lot, you know, we, we added on some of that capability. We, we are initially focused on, you know, price setting analytics, optimization, then we got into CPQ and then, uh, but then we also got into this rebate side because, you know, our clients were like, Hey, we, you know, they they were thinking about it holistically because when you start to put together a waterfall, I'm like, okay, it's great to have that visibility, but if I'm just like, not able to manage that part of it, then it, it it's really, you're not getting as much impact as you could otherwise. Well, thanks so much for your time and uh, thanks everyone for tuning in to Pricing Matters. Thanks, Gabe.